Welcome to Dev Jams. This is where we're going to be talking about amazing projects, innovative projects that developers are doing, whether they're websites, mobile apps, or just other interesting projects that are utilizing Cloudinary in interesting ways. Joining me for this episode, and of course, every episode, is Becky Peltz, who handles instructional design for Cloudinary. Becky, it's great to have you for, again, of course, for this episode. Hey, it's great to be here. And I think this has been a really great episode. So many interesting things came out of this. And what's great about this is that there are a lot of things, as Becky is pointing out. Whether you're somebody that is trying to better understand how to handle open graph images for a website, whether you're somebody that's trying to understand all the different JavaScript frameworks out there and how to properly work with them, such as Svelte, whether you're somebody that is trying to better understand how to work in a Jamstack environment, there's a lot of amazing pieces of knowledge that I think that Ryan was able to show with this website that he's developed for himself, his personal blog, and the way that he's handling open graph images, whether it's with the Svelte and Sapper setup that he has, also with all the work that he's doing with Netlify functions, there's just a lot to unpackage with this overall episode. Yeah, well, I know in talking to Ryan, he came from a design background, and he really opened my eyes to how important it is to have that really nice looking open graph or Twitter card, you know, entry in your web page so that, I mean, it's basically like a business card, you know, your website is being introduced to the public. And I think that having it look nice, being able to manage it, and it gives credibility to your overall application. So that was something, I mean, I knew about the technology, but I didn't really realize how important it was. I was real happy to see that. You know, we had talked to Chris Coyer a couple of weeks ago, and we saw that Puppeteer was used in a way to create this kind of curated font application. And now we're seeing a totally different way. I think it's just so interesting how Ryan conceived of this, where he basically just created a web page, static web page using a Jamstack, and then he just takes pictures of it, you know, using Puppeteer and turns those into his open graph images. So it's just a, a, a very nicely conceived application. And then, like you mentioned, Sam, I hope everyone watches out for here his implementation with Netlify's serverless function because with the serverless function, you can have some security. You've got your environment variables in the back end, but you can easily deploy that functionality. And Ryan does a real good job of walking us through that. I couldn't agree more. So let's go right into it. Let's hear what Ryan has to say about his project and of course, all the things that we've teased in this introduction. We'll see you in a little bit at the end of the episode for some key takeaways based on the conversation that we have with Ryan. Ryan, we are so excited to have you here for the program today because you're obviously doing some amazing work when it comes to development for your own personal presence. But one thing that I definitely think that caught my eye as well as Becky's eye was what you're doing ultimately with open graph images, which is something that I feel like in a lot of cases, working with many different types of developers, sometimes open graph is almost an afterthought. Sometimes it's not necessarily the first thing that they're thinking of when they're publishing new pieces of content. So finding ways to dynamically do that and do that with Cloudinary was something that I we're very, very excited to talk to you about today. Yeah, I've done a lot of open graph in the past for work, and it's definitely a tedious process to go in and keep all that in mind and to remake it every time you change your branding manually. So automating things is, is good for sure. I was wondering if we could just specify or share what open graph is in case anyone out there hasn't used it. Sure. So open graph is actually one of two pieces of this. It's sort of the Facebook implementation of those little preview cards that you see as you're scrolling through social media feeds. Open Graph is proprietary to Facebook, but it's used by a lot of other places. Discord, Slack, iMessage even, I think, hooks into it. It's a set of meta tags that you put on your site that sort of show those social media crawlers how to render a little preview. So there's Open Graph for Facebook, and then Twitter has their own. It doesn't have its own branded name like open graph does but basically there are special meta tags that go in the head of your site that help to 
make your post stand out, bring a little bit of your branding into, you know, say Facebook or Twitter or wherever else. So just sort of the social media aspect of your web page, and does it contribute to SEO, to getting known through that? I'm certainly not an SEO expert. I, I have to assume it does, because in addition to the image that is shown, it also can bring in your title, some tags, preview text, things like that. So I have to imagine the more information you give them, uh, the more they're able to help people get to your content. I've noticed that since I've added this to my site, I get a lot more clicks, you know, things standing out on a timeline. I, I can't tell you how many times I've remembered reading a post and just scrolled and scrolled and scrolled trying to find it again and never can find it. So it helps when you see other people doing this. You can see that an image that stands out or something and it just helps things be more discoverable. I, I noticed like on Slack that if you're using Open Graph, you're going to get a nice report of your web page. You'll have some mm -hmm. control over how people are perceiving your Slack content. Yeah, that was one of the bigger things for me was like you just mentioned the, the control over it. All of these services do their best to guess. And sometimes their best guess is just not how you would want your content presented. So it just helps with that personal branding. Looking at this from the perspective of like things that you probably have done before you were doing this for your personal presence, you mentioned that you've done this a lot for your previous work. Let's just mm -hmm. step back and talk about what, what ultimately got to you this part where you're doing software development, you're doing all this in this way. I know that you've mentioned to me in previous discussions that you have a background in design. Mm -hmm. Talk about like what it took for you to get to this place where you just said, I got to be able to do this in this way that's more programmatic be able to do this in a way that is not going to be so time intensive? Yeah. So my school background is actually in graphic design. The way it worked out, I had one semester left and only like one required class. So I kind of got to pick a couple things and I was like, well, I'll take web two. That sounds fun. And then a couple jobs out of school were sort of web adjacent. I was on a digital media team in-house at a big company doing a lot of their social graphics. And it was managing a couple of internal brands under one umbrella. So each brand had their own slightly different, they're all related, but they have like a slightly different font, slightly different set of colors. So when we need to get a graphic out for say five in-house brands that are mostly the same, but different enough, there's a lot you can do with the Adobe programs to set up templates and all that, but it still is a really tedious process to go set all that up. And, and so that's sort of my experience in the back of my mind working on this, like, wow, it'd be cool to automate that. From there, I was doing design at a, a web design and development agency, which still involved a little bit of stuff like this, but it was much more like, you know, full web page mockups. And probably about five years ago now, if I really count back, I made the jump full time to the development team. Basically, I learned enough you know, from that one class in college and then working at that agency and kind of poking around in the dev tools during the QA process, asking enough questions that I sort of just learned, you know, front end development. So with those skills and then things I had learned from design, learned to kind of automate things. One of the things I used to do on my portfolio section of my site was the source set, like picture element. For people who aren't familiar, it lets you sort of art direct responsive images a little bit more fine grain than just scaling them. So you're able to export different aspect ratios, different focuses. I mean, essentially literally different like JPEG files at different resolutions. And then the browser will sort of sort out based on screen size, what to, to give to the user. So, you know, you have 10, 15 things in your portfolio. Each thing's got, let's say three images you want to show. And then you're, you're manually cropping and exporting four or five source set things, but that, that's a lot of images to do manually. So when I was revisiting this OG image thing, it sort of made more sense to, to automate that where I could. A lot of the design work I do nowadays is directly in the browser anyways, versus doing it in, in say Photoshop or whatever, and then exporting it. Serverless functions are cool. Headless browsers are cool. You have all the tools to do this with web technology, 
And then Jamstack kind of lets you stitch a bunch of things together. And at the end of the pipeline, you have a, a JPEG, which is cool. And what's great about this, in my opinion, is that everything that we're going to be walking through with this project, I mean, obviously, this is something that you've gone and done for your own personal presence, as you've said, for your blog mm -hmm. that you have. But this is something that's highly applicable for basically anybody that's doing development for websites that are, need to have a social public type of presence. So that way they can make sure that their reach is that much more optimized, mm -hmm. but also in a way where they're not spending two, three, four hours cutting everything up in Photoshop or Illustrator, like maybe you had to do prior before you developed right. this concept. And it's the worst when you make one little spelling mistake and then you've got to go re-export 30 images. It's definitely, if you can save that pain, you should, because I've done it and it's not super fun. <laughs> I completely, I mean, as someone that's used Photoshop for many, many years, I agree completely. So I, I think it's a pain point that anything that's been where you're not pulling from dynamic fields in any way, it, where, where something is much more static, that pain mm -hmm. point just becomes that much more accentuated because you have to think like, what are all the endpoints or what are all the outputs of the various images? And does it have that spelling error or does it have that poorly cropped piece? So yeah, I, 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 I know that pain all too well. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people do. <laughs> Nowadays, we're all kind of thinking of scaling too. And so having to rely on a lot of manual processes is, is actually not feasible. You can't do a project mm -hmm. if that's the case. And on the topic of me doing this for my blog, you know, I'm just one person who doesn't want to spend a ton of time doing this every time I tweak a brand color or something. So I can only imagine the time it saved me, how much that scales to a company doing much more than I am. That's a really good point. So let's talk about the blog and all okay. the work that you're doing into this. So what is your blog ultimately built on? What's the stack? What's the framework? Sure. So I've been doing my personal blog in the Jamstack ecosystem for probably cl also close to five years. So I started with Jekyll a number of years ago. Ironically, now I do a lot of Ruby at work, but at the time, no idea about Ruby. So anytime anything went slightly wrong, that was a, a whole thing. It was about the time that I was getting into the React ecosystem. So I, I started a Gatsby blog. Actually, earlier this year, so sort of what's led me on this process of doing these things is January 2020, I deleted my, my entire code base, but I archived the repo. It's still around, but started completely over from scratch with just a fresh Gatsby blog. And so I have been rebuilding its piece at a time and, and adding these little things as I go. Just the old one had gotten too unwieldy. So start fresh, kind of design it as I go, add, add features as I go. And, and my goal was to write about it, the things I was learning as I was doing them. So I was on Gatsby for probably half of this year, just because I work in React pretty much full time now. I've been sort of interested in Svelte for a while now, sort of on and off, and was doing kind of side projects in it. So I think in July, maybe, I made the switch on my personal blog to refactor from Gatsby over to Svelte and Sapper. And so that's what it's running on right now, is Svelte, which it's a generated front-end framework rather than um, React or Vue, which are more client-side. Svelte does more work at compile time. So hopefully it ships less to the browser than a full client-side rendering does. I know Gatsby does a lot of work to sort of do a lot of the same things. There's a lot of overlap in, in a lot of these technologies. So I know Svelte's not super popular yet, maybe, but I think a lot of what I did is applicable to pretty much anybody using JavaScript, really. Svelte gives you some nice wrappers around it, but it's all pretty straightforward under the hood. It kind of says a lot for Jamstack that you can make that switch because all your content is basically marked down. So you're just right. don't have to worry about that. You know, we had heard from you that you had some ideas as far as like a greener web and least power in your decision. Yeah, that's sort of what ultimately made me explore Svelte more. I know speaking to the issue earlier of, of doing things at scale. You know, not that many people read my blog. I'm sure that in the grand scheme of the web, it's very small drop in the the overall ocean. But one thing I'm interested in and kind of why I chose Felt was it ships less JavaScript. It does less rendering on the client. And when you scale that, I'd love to get more into the numbers of it maybe in the future. That's research I need to do. 
but I, I think that's really interesting if you can save megabytes of JavaScript per person at scale. Like, what does that mean, you know, for, for huge companies with millions of users? And that's hopefully something I'll get to explore more in the future. And, and I think Jamstack is, is great for that too, just sort of inherently, you know, static sites are, are smaller and faster and you do the work at build time. You're not building things dynamically. And then of course, we were talking about open graph images here for these images to be served. You're using Cloudinary. Why did you come to that decision to use something that's going to be cloud-based with something mm -hmm. that's going to be utilizing CDNs? What was the decision there? Yeah. So two things. One, I know I mentioned before the pain of having to go in and, and resize half a dozen images for the source set. So it's super awesome that Cloudinary lets you use the query parameters to resize things. So you can just sort of pass sizes via a URL and get back an image that makes sense to, to serve to a user. You know, speaking of shipping less at scale, images are, are one of the bigger parts of the web bundles overall. So having a service like Cloudinary where you can decide to ship a smaller image I'm sure saves a lot of bandwidth. And, and that's something that is really awesome to be able to automate through Cloudinary. Like I didn't actually have to do any work there to get that resize to work. So that saved me a lot of time in being able to sort of resize things easily. And then also images are hard where to host them, how to serve them. When I was at a web agency, we did a lot of work into that, an in-house solution. It was a lot of work and not something that I wanted to, or, or, or frankly, something that I could do just for my blog. So I, I think that's one of the strengths of the Jamstack. You know, the A in Jamstack is for APIs. So any, anywhere you can pull in a service of people who really know what they're doing, you know, like, I don't want to say Cloudinary does one thing because I'm sure there's so many things, but like you're an image company, you do that one thing super well. So something that I can take and hand to experts who can handle it better definitely makes sense to do. Now, of course, there's other things that you're probably tying into all of this, like in terms of libraries, APIs. I know that there's been lots of discussions openly in the web, and I know you're using this in this way as well, but about Puppeteer. Yeah, so Puppeteer is uh, a headless browser, meaning that you can sort of orchestrate it with, they have an API of JavaScript commands. So you can drive this web browser around headlessly, which just means that, you know, it's not physically opening Chrome and clicking on stuff. It's sort of all happening ethereally somewhere, I suppose, because that's kind of where I started with this was like, okay, so I've built this in HTML, I can pass data to it. So like, what's the next step? I could go screenshot these things and, and upload them myself or you know, you can have a robot do it for you. So that's kind of where Puppeteer comes in. Puppeteer, I think, is built by the Chrome team. So it mostly or only uses Chrome. I know there's a competitor called Playwright that sort of brings in a couple other browsers. I believe it's a Microsoft product. So I played around with both of those. And what landed me on Puppeteer was a limitation of serverless functions. Shipping an entire browser in a a uh, Lambda function, they're sort of inherently limited because a Lambda function needs to spin up quickly, not take up too many resources on this shared server. So Puppeteer handled that a little bit better. They have a sort of AWS spin-off package that you can use where it's small enough to ship in a Lambda function. Where ultimately on my project, that is where this code runs. And then one other thing that was interesting about Puppeteer, since it is a Google product centered around Chrome, in order to run this locally, rather than pulling from a node module, you can just point the browser to open your local install of Chrome. So that was a big plus for me was to be able to run this locally as well, and not only in a Lambda function, because having to deploy every time you want to test something is its own kind of pain point there. I, I also noticed in your repo that you have a test, a local test, so you're able to do your testing there locally with that. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Cypress, which is a, I'm not sure if you would call it a headless browser or not, um, but it, it's very similar to Puppeteer in that it actually opens a browser and clicks through 
your, your project with a series of, of JavaScript commands. I've done a lot of unit and integration testing with Jest and React at work. I think that's way overkill for just my blog. So I love Cypress. It's awesome to be able to watch it open a window and just kind of click through the website. It's an end to end framework. So that means that you're hitting at a high level, like can a user go to a page and read a post, not necessarily like unit testing everything. So for this one, I just made sure that you could hit this URL with data, that data made it to the DOM. And then I actually just used a snapshot test to make sure that does this image rendered from this match what I expect? There's a, a Cypress plugin for that, but it was all, there was a really awesome ecosystem of testing out there for, for image-based things. We have such a big audience, Ryan, that's focused on Jamstack. And of course, developers are trying to understand how to get involved with it and what they can do to get started with it. With where your site's ultimately being hosted, did any of those features like the APIs, the libraries they're using, did any of that come into play with where your site's being hosted at? It did. So I am a big fan of Netlify. As a host, it couldn't be easier. You link up your repository. Mine is on GitHub. I think they have Bitbucket and GitLab. I'm sure they do everything. You actually can just drag a, a local file folder into their web page and it'll put that up on their CDN for you. So Netlify started just as an awesome, easy host. It's great for static sites because they'll go to your repo, run your build command, do all that. And they've slowly been adding things over the years just to make the Jamstack process easier. So one thing that they offer is a wrapper around AWS Lambda functions called Netlify functions. They make that just as easy as they do hosting and deploying. You have a functions directory in your site and each JavaScript entry file gets deployed at its own URL based on what you name it in the file, I believe. You can configure things. They've got a, a Toml config file, or you can kind of use the UI on their website. Both are pretty straightforward. But yeah, you just put your function in there. Um, you make sure that it exports a handler method. And then anytime you hit that URL, they'll run whatever code you put in there. And it's all Amazon Web Services under the hood. So you know it's reliable, it's fast, but you don't have to deal with the frankly overwhelming AWS console yourself because I've done that and it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a lot. I don't know if anybody understands quite all yeah. of it. But... Security is really tough too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that too, they handle all the security. You've got a little bit of work to do, but for the most part, like they make sure your endpoints are secure and they have a really generous free tier. So yeah, I mean, already hosting there, it was hard not to choose to also put the functions there. But if there was a way to have done that, you know, say if I was hosting somewhere else, there's a good chance I still would have picked Netlify functions just because they make it that easy. One thing I've noticed working with Jamstack is that if you're a, a, a seasoned front end developer, you can move into full stack development really easily without having to get into learning a back end framework or anything like that. You basically sure. just deploy to a functions folder and now you're on the web. You know, you've moved outside the browser. And, and to me, you know, as a designer, front end person, to me, that's the fun part. So having somebody handle what I would consider the unfun part is, is awesome. <laughs> Because I, I, you know, I, I've gone down the path of like trying to set up a server and it's just not my wheelhouse. And so it's easy to get frustrated and give up versus like you said, it's just a JavaScript file and, and it's got the fun part. So it just kind of keeps you going. So we've got Svelte, we've got Cloudinary, we've got Netlify, we've got Puppeteer, we've got all these various components, libraries, mm -hmm. APIs that are all working together to develop and handle the blog, but also, of course, the open graph images that are associated with the posts. I think, at least in my opinion, this is a great chance for us to start taking a look at the project and okay. walking through some of the things and that are there. I hope you share your blog because it is really a beautiful blog. I love the way that you have those tabs to show the URL encoding and things like that. It's just very nice. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I can touch on that a little bit. I'm sure we'll see how the code works, but this is a, I know we talked a little bit earlier about having all that content just in Markdown files, but- This is all Markdown content that you're- It writing. is, yeah. I think that a lot of people with sort of traditional full stack 
skills, I guess we could call it, sort of shy away from this, like, oh, you're going to host your content in Markdown, like, why not a database? But this whole ecosystem, I think, has grown so much in the last few years that there's tons you can do. So yeah, we can jump in, I guess, at the beginning, which would be that Markdown file. So what we're seeing here in the browser is sort of just what one of my posts looks like. This is a little meta. This is the post about how I built this feature. But yeah, this is all just a Markdown file. I guess to talk about the tabs. Uh, so this is using a, a Svelte library called MDSVEX, which is sort of just Svelte's version of MDX, which is a React uh, and Vue feature, uh, or not feature, but also third-party library. But it lets you use framework JavaScript components directly in your Markdown. So that's sort of how I'm rendering these tabs here is this is all the nice markdown syntax, you know, here's an H2 is a paragraph. And then if you need to escape that and jump into something a little bit more complicated, you can just write your framework code right in here. So I think that's super cool, but kind of how each post starts, this is how I don't want to say every Jamstack framework works, but the three that I've used, so Jekyll, Gatsby, and Sapper all kind of work this way. Each markdown file has this fenced section at the beginning called front matter, and it's in the, the YAML format. So this is a tab-based object, I suppose. So this is where all the data about the post lives that you see here in the header, or if we go back to the page, you know, title, date, excerpt, all that stuff. This is kind of what I need to get into the OG image. The title, I've got a, a image for each, some tags. I played around a lot with like how much will fit into a tiny square because like I've got this ex excerpt for each post, which I ultimately didn't put in the image, but this gets rendered to this template file for this page. And the thing that we care about today is how does this ultimately get into that generate image route to hit that function to generate the screenshot. So there is kind of some weird stuff going on that I need to refactor. If I knew everything I knew now when I did this, I might have set up my, my whole project slightly differently. But for now, all of this post data is getting piped through this component here that sort of just handles these meta tags. I want to move it around, but that's just for my own sake. It wouldn't actually affect how this renders out statically. Those are your open graph meta tags down there then. So those are the yes, these are ultimately giving you the OG and the Twitter. This object gets bundled up and then passed into this component through this markdown door, which is a sapper thing and kind of doesn't matter how it works, but just that this markdown here is how the data gets from a post into this script section so that ultimately I can kind of render it out here because there's a little bit of, of data massaging going on. So things will either come from the props or the markdown store, or I have a config file that has some generic stuff like my Twitter handle, my URL. So I'm taking those three things and kind of massaging them into one object here, which then I'm rendering out to these meta tags so that the browsers can see them. And this all ends in the head of the website here. Make this a little bit more readable. All of these meta tags just end up kind of in the DOM exactly as they are over here. One thing I want to touch on here, Ryan, so like you'd see that with the way that you have the open graph tags, we talked about this a little bit where you have open graph, but Twitter has their own way to be handling these types of pieces of content, Twitter cards. Mm -hmm. Why do we need to do it in these different ways? Like if a developer were just to do Twitter cards or if a developer were just to do open graph, are we missing something? Is it where like something would potentially get rerouted the wrong way? Like why, why do you ultimately need to call the two different options? I started with Twitter and, and primarily did my research in, the, in their documentation. That's where I share my content. So that one was a little bit uh, closer to home for me, I guess. In their documentation, they actually say that if these Twitter colon whatever tags are missing, that they will do their best to fall back to OG tags. And then I guess even there's probably a third fallback there 
you know, just generic things like the site title, maybe some keywords. Because before I implemented this, I was getting some preview on Twitter when I posted these things. But to answer your question, I think it's ultimately about just fine tuning how you want these to show up. There's a couple of things that like Open Graph gives you that Twitter doesn't. Like I don't think Twitter lets you have pixel control over the size of your image. You can sort of choose between a couple of preset aspect ratios here. So I think it'll do its best if you choose one over the other. I don't know if say like Facebook could look to the Twitter tags. That's an interesting question, but I found it was just better to kind of read through the documentation for both, play around with the options and just make sure that you were getting what you wanted out of both. I agree. I, I think you're doing the right thing because making sure that you can define, because of course, all of these platforms, Facebook, Twitter, all the ones that are also using Open Graph, as you said, those are going to be ones that are continually changing their ideas of how things should be rendered, how things should look. So guaranteeing that you're not just falling back to one, it'll mm -hmm. guarantee that if Twitter decides to do a big UI overhaul, you're ensuring that your content is much more future-proof by defining both of these massive networks together. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one nice thing about doing this through uh, a static site generator like this is like, you know, say they tweak what this particular aspect ratio is called. You just change it once and you rebuild your site and, and hopefully you're mostly fine. It's interesting looking at the code because I can see, you know, different structures, different, you know, things that the two serve, the two sites want. But the data that goes in is the same, that there, there's almost an opportunity for someone to build a service and a whole company that just <laughs> yeah. serves up these things. <laughs> yeah, I think about that a lot when I'm writing these things for my site. We'll get into this a little bit later, probably. But I've got just a big file of helper functions. And I often think about that where I'm like, I could throw this up on NPM and like open source this and help other people out. But yeah, there's a lot of overlap here in the content, but they were just different enough that I think oh, it's leaving nice it manually and kind of looking at it for, for a little, thinking about how to kind of make it more succinct. Yeah, no, it looks really good. I mean, I'm glad that we can see the full set of them there. One thing I was really glad to see is that both offer the ability to pass alt text, which was something that when you're generating these images that have text, I think it's important to remember that image baked into a text is not accessible to non-sighted users. So the ability to pass alt text through, I thought was really cool. So at this point, we're looking at it and we're seeing that you, this is the post that you have and the details that are being associated with through the markdown files and the associated spelt files. Mm -hmm. But then this is the dynamic data. How is this content being turned into the image that's being used for the OG? Yeah, that's that's one thing to look at for sure. So there's a couple different tools here. You know, Twitter provides one, Facebook provides one. I liked this one called iFramely that kind of pulls it into one nice thing that you can kind of just click through. So all of these tags are what shows up in your card preview below. And the one that we're concerned with here is how to generate this image. So it's the Twitter colon image and the OG colon image. That's pretty straightforward. So these are actually just a variable that I'm building out here. So this is ultimately where the image will live on Cloudinary. So that this URL, both of the bot crawlers for these networks, they want an actual canonical URL for an image. So we need to give it this link to a Cloudinary PNG. And so the way that my code works, there is sort of two routes that you can get to this. This is the Netlify function code. So this is the Lambda function that runs. We go all the way down. So the way that this works is this URL generates based on the title of the post. So we'll hit this URL. And to look at the handler method here, it will do one of two things. It will... Uh, make a fetch call to that URL. And if this returns something, I've got some fun logs in here that no one will ever see. But if that image exists, we'll just return the URL that already hosts that image on Cloudinary. And if not, we'll go through the steps of generating it. But that was one thing that was important to me was 
to run this code as little as possible, actually. I'll be generous and say 100 people, right? If 100 people go to my blog, I don't need to spin up Puppeteer and screenshot the image 100 times. And that was one benefit of using Cloudinary was it can live somewhere. So it, it will live at this URL that gets returned, or I guess this is the URL that's passed in, but that, that's ultimately how we get the image anytime but the first time that someone comes to this function. The fun part here is what do we do when an image doesn't exist? So there's kind of a couple things going on here. The first is this generate image route on the site. So this is just a URL that I have. So this is all post build time. We're going to do all of this without running a server, without using a post request or anything like that. So the first thing to sort of solve is how to get data to this page, because ultimately what we're going to do is run Puppeteer to take a screenshot of this purple box here. And then that'll go through some steps to get uploaded to Cloudinary that, that we can get to in a second. But how this works is again this is in svelte but i think that these are pretty these are all just vanilla javascript functions that svelte has a nice wrapper around but so how this will work is we're going to pass these through a url query parameters which is a native browser function so anything in a url that comes after the question mark wikipedia has i think i linked to this in my blog post wikipedia has the best breakdown of a URL I've ever seen where it sort of pieces out what every single uh, things I've never even heard of, like what they are. But one thing I, you work with a lot for like social media campaigns, sources, you know, you want to see where someone came from before they clicked on a link. You can pass data in this query parameter. So like here's a bunch here, but just to kind of demonstrate, there are key value pairs. So the question mark denotes like we're starting a query string and then you've got a key and then anything after it is the value. So if we reload this, mine is set up to like title is a, a key that I'm grabbing out and it will dump it into the DOM here. So Svelte has some cool helpers around this and they're like page, um, page is a store and it has an object you can access called query. And so it does some work to just break these up into like a nice object for you. So I'm grabbing all of these off of the query and they're exported or they're instantiated as variables here and then dumped out into the template. So you can kind of see like, I've got the title, I'm gonna loop through the categories, post the URL down there. I was thinking about excerpt, but I'm really terrible at deleting comments. <laughs> There's the background image. I don't have alt text here because ultimately no one's ever gonna need to see this page in this form. And if I go through my conveniently history here and get one that actually has images. So that one fills in and you can see all of this up here. It's an incredibly long URL because there's a lot to go in here. So that's the front matter, right? It's using the front matter? To yes. To go back to this component that all of this gets piped through, it takes the front matter via this props variable here, and it passes them into one of those helper functions that I mentioned earlier. So this object to params is going to return this long string here. And let's see. What did I call it? There we go. So yeah, object to params will take that front matter object and it will do some more built-in browser JavaScript here and return me a params object that I will stringify to pass into the URL. And URL search params was something that I learned about working on this project. And it's actually really cool. It's a, a built-in JavaScript function that will encode a series of key value pairs for you. So one thing here that we can see, so like Inktober 2020 has a space in it, but if we look at the URL, obviously you can't just throw a space in a URL. These things need to be encoded. And so there's a couple different ways to do that that I touched on in the post, but since I'm passing an object, this was, I think the most helpful for me, but it will encode those things for you. So you can give it a full sentence with spaces and numbers and 
you know, reserved characters, question marks, all that, and it gives you back a valid URL. And then sort of the reverse to that, and I'll show you where I'm using this one later, is we can take a string and, and then give it back to this URL search params constructor, and it will give you back an object. So this was a super helpful, this is sort of the key to all of this, is being able to pass data through the URL. And this makes it a lot less painful to do than trying to like regex things out of strings for sure. So what we need to do is we need to get that front matter data that is stringified uh, using that function to the Netlify function, which is what I'm doing here. And right now I'm sort of just cheating by logging this out down here so that it's easy to click on. But so what this will do is it will build out that same query string and it's truncated, I guess. It's a lot longer than that, but yeah, there we go. So it will build out that same query string, but instead of tacking it on the end of this route, it will tack it on the end of the Netlify function route. So if we come back to that function here, your handler is passed a few things, which are actually really similar to the Svelte API. So you get the event, which is sort of everything about the request. And one of the things that you can pull off of it is query string parameters. I'm checking the title. So you can query string parameters is an object. So that's sort of what led me to write those two functions to sort of go back and forth between strings and objects here. So I'm checking the title. And if the title doesn't exist and we get into the body down here, I am taking that full query string and passing it on to that template so that we can render something like this and get ready to screenshot it. Now, one thing I noticed when looking at some of the previous code that you have there, it looks like you were using some type of node functions in this case. How is that coming into play with some of the work that you're doing here? Because of course, this is still a project, but it looks like you are ultimately using some form of Node.js with this project as well. Yeah, so Lambda functions are, they're cloud functions, they're sort of interchangeable terms. Lambda functions, AWS functions, cloud functions, Netlify functions. Ultimately, they're just code that you write that runs on someone else's computer, right? Because that's what the cloud is. So this runs on a node server. There are, I believe, a lot of different types of cloud functions in many languages. I'm like 99% a JavaScript developer, so Node sort of was the one that made sense for me. And as an added bonus, I can share a lot of these helper functions that I wrote between my static site and what gets bundled up to this to get sent to this node server in the cloud. So there's node fetch is one. Fetch is a browser API, but somebody has been nice enough to wrap this in a, a way that it's usable on the server, which is what I'm using to check and see if we've got this image already or if we need to generate it. This is the, I mentioned this earlier, the kind of minimal version of Chromium that you can ship to the function. So one thing about the way that cloud functions work is there is zero dependency, meaning that you need to send them a bundle of code and they're not going to go, when they spin up to run your code, they're not going to have the time to like NPM install a bunch of dependencies and bring a bunch of stuff with you. So I forget off the top of my head what the, the limit of megabytes is, but it's fairly small. So you just need to be very cognizant of like what all you're including and trying to ship a whole browser, like I said, is problematic for reasons. Yeah, you can't do that. It already runs nodes. So you, you do have access to all of the um, built-in node functions. There's a lot of those. I believe you still have to import them just to kind of let it know that you're going to need that function. But yeah, it's best to lean on the framework that's already running on the server, you know, whether it's... Yeah. Sometimes oh, they're also called microservices and they want them to be exactly, both small yeah. and fast. Like you're not going to run a big process in one of these. Right. You know, your work with Puppeteer is interesting too, because we've seen a lot lately of interesting work done with Puppeteer. Do you want to talk about how you use that? Sure. Puppeteer was something I hadn't used prior to this at all. I actually think Cypress might have it as a dependency, but you're interacting with it through another layer there. So it was a little bit different this time. To give a huge uh, shout out to Ira Adiranokun, Adira she wrote an awesome blog post on her blog uh, about how to use Puppeteer that was really instrumental in all of this. But so I've sort of 
broken all of the puppeteer stuff out into its own little method here that I'm calling down here. So once we're at this portion of the, the code here, so we've determined that we don't have an image, so we need to pass those params through to this page. So we've got this page, and then we're going to call this take screenshot function here. And so what that does is it takes a URL, which will be the URL to this page. There's a little bit of work here to either run this locally or go to the live site. Ultimately, this does live on my live site. We'll go to that and, and build this here. And then this take screenshot function will spin up an instance of Puppeteer, which I mentioned earlier is just Chrome running somewhere in the cloud somewhere. So the first thing to do was to determine, like, are we in the cloud? Because you can't actually, in kind of the same way that you can't run full Chrome on a cloud server, you can't run this AWS Lambda version of Chrome on your local computer without having to set up, you know, whatever it is that AWS has running. So I stole this idea from Wes Boss. He has this on his Gatsby site, but I thought this was, was clever and kind of funny. If you are not running in the cloud, if you're running locally, you just point your Chromium Puppeteer executable like to your local install of Chrome. And it blew my <laughs> mind that that worked, but it does. And I, I kind of love that. Uh, I imagine you can do this on Windows as well, but this path is going to be different. I'm doing this on Mac. And if we are on the cloud, we want to let the Chromium package just point us to wherever its executable path is. We're going to give it the default arguments. I don't actually really know what these are. I imagine it has to do with memory. And luckily, I didn't have to dig into this. Default arguments worked here. And we're going to run it in headless mode because we are doing this in the cloud. There's no reason to spin up the visual part of this, just slow the function down. Because in addition to size, you are limited to the amount of time that you can run this as well. So anything you can do to sort of make this faster and smaller, you want to do that. So we're going to run it headless. And so what we will do is take this URL that I passed in from below. We'll set the page size. This is important actually to look at where I had given this, the size here. We want to make sure that we're, we're generating the screenshot at the correct size. So we'll set the viewport just to this size here. And we will take a screenshot, which Puppeteer is going to return a buffer. This was my first time working with buffers. So I could be not entirely accurate here. But my understanding was that a buffer is sort of an in-memory version of something, um, like an image, a sound file, video. So this buffer will live sort of in the memory of the node server running in this cloud function. And so to actually do something with it, we need to, it'll be returned from the function, but to make it usable in a way, we'll need to encode it. Base64 is just a way to stringify image data. So we'll do that with the buffer and then give it a little bit of formatting here just to kind of let the next function in this chain know that, hey, this is an image, it's a PNG format, and it's Base64 encoded. Well, as it turns out, that's what the Cloudinary Upload API likes. <laughs> that is why I chose that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And there's a lot of options here. You know, if you're trying to do, I know Cloudinary hosts video, I'm sure there's a way to do that as well. Maybe I'll get to that in the future too. But that is exactly why I chose this was, yep, that came right out of the Cloudinary, um, what, what we prefer documentation. And then once we've got this return from that function, it's set to this screenshot variable here. And uh, this is where we get into the, the Cloudinary portion of this, actually. So there is another helper function here called put image, which is sort of the opposite of get image. Get image calls node fetch. And put image is going to call the Cloudinary API. And so like that's a little bit weird on its face. Like, Why not use the Cloudinary API both times? Because Cloudinary does have put image. Yeah, so Cloudinary does have several methods available here to like, I could have searched based on the title. There were ways to, to kind of give information and then get this back. But to the point of speed here, 
you want these functions to be as fast as possible. And the more things I was putting in Cloudinary, the more things that API was having to search through. So that's sort of why get image just runs a fetch call um, because we know the URL that we pass in that we want the image to exist at. So if it's a 404, that's really all I needed to know versus Cloudinary wanted to give me all kinds of helpful information about that image um, <laughs> that ultimately I'll need later. But that's kind of why get image is just a fetch call versus put image, which interacts directly with Cloudinary. And you're saying you know the URL for this because ultimately the URL for this is derived directly from the title of what you've de declared yes. with the post. Okay. Yes. Ultimately, this URL will live at Cloudinary slash, you know, my Cloudinary images uploads. I chose to put these all in one directory. So they all live in this social images folder here. And then, like you said, the last little bit here is derived from the post title. And, and that's actually a really good thing that we're showing here because something that comes up in a lot of trainings that Becky and I do is how should people define their public IDs, ultimately the, the file or asset names when they're in Cloudinary. So I think it's a very eloquent way that you've gone about doing it is that because you know that typically your post titles are going to be unique, you're not going to have a lot of posts that are named the exact same thing, mm -hmm. it creates that uniqueness to ensure that all of them have a unique public ID, even though they're all being put into that same folder. So I think that right. was a really good method on your side. I, I thought about that a lot. And, and ultimately why I think I'm safe to do that here is I, I don't think I could have a, a post with the same title, even if I wanted to, because of the way that Sapper is going to do file-based routing. I would end up with two URLs that were the same. And I'm not actually sure what would happen there, like what, which one would win out, but. Um, <laughs> I don't because, wanna know, frankly. <laughs> right, yeah, that's, uh, hopefully I'll never have to know. But yeah, these definitely should be unique. Yeah, so I think it's a, it's a good method. And I think it's where a lot of times people spend time like literally thinking about like, well, how should I handle my public IDs? So the fact that you're able to come up with something that I think works and honestly probably works for many other people that are going to be doing this for blogging content, like in terms of like article style development, I think this is the right way to go. Yeah. And if for some reason this doesn't work out, I don't recall the, the syntax off the top of my head, but I know that one of the, the options you can pass in, oh, no, here, it's right here. It's unique file names. So yeah, I imagine if you flip this to true, it would like append a number on the end or something. Yep. Exactly. It'd be a um, random string of characters. Exactly. Yeah. So if you're worried about like overwriting your images, which mine will do sort of by design, you could flip this to true. The downside to that would be it wouldn't quite work for my scenario where I'm then um, counting on knowing that complete URL string later. Exactly. But this is a thing, you know, that if you could probably figure out how to make this work for you somehow. And then looking at like the overall structure that you had for the Cloudinary URL as well, I think that was in your index file, if I remember correctly. I can't remember. Uh, right nope. here. Yes, exactly. So like you can see here, like if I'm looking at this correctly, we're going through, we're staying, it's going to go Cloudinary. It's bringing through all of the details from your ENV, which is great. Of course, this is something we always talk to students about. That like ENVs are really important. Don't display all of that yeah. confidential information. There's three things, three environment variables you need to pass to Cloudinary. Your public and private API keys are two of them. And the third one was this cloud ID. I think I'm being a little bit extra by encoding this this way, because this is publicly available in the URL. Right. So this is less for protection and more for just flexibility, I guess, if I decide to change this for some reason. But yeah, so that is what it's doing is I've got an ENV file that's got just the URL to my Cloudinary account in it. Yeah, which is smart, best practice, absolutely. And then, of course, you know that all of your images are going to be uploaded. It's not being fetched or brought mm -hmm. in a different way. It's also, you know, they're always images. So that's why having that as part of that static URL structure makes perfect sense. And then what you're seeing here with the Slugify and all that, of course, that's just incorporating all of that detail from mm -hmm. the, the meta. So I could see how this is all kind of tying itself together, which is really impressive. Yeah. And... I think if I do more work in this area in the future, I'll probably abstract this out a little bit. But this social images directory, if I go back to my media manager here, I've got a few things in my Cloudinary account. These literally are just like folders on your computer. So you could, you know, upload this to any path. These all go 
into this directory just because, so I changed my brand colors recently from a purple to a slightly different purple. Mm -hmm. And so I had to regenerate all these images. And what I ended up doing was just deleting this directory uh, and then loading those URLs again. And so it just kind of repopulated this whole folder with slightly different images here. That's so actually an interesting concept because mm -hmm. I, I think this is pointing out that now you're future proofing this in some ways because in many ways what you're doing is duo toning your overall look, be, but you're right. Like if I were to suddenly be like, well, Ryan's blog now needs to have blue. Mm -hmm. Ultimately you go and change some of the details here, but then the URLs are going to stay the same and just provides a different output because of you overriding too. So it's actually one benefit to that. Yeah, and the Cloudinary has a concept of versioning uh, built right. in that I haven't really explored. But, you know, if for whatever reason I wanted to save, you know, the old version of this for nostalgia, I guess, whatever, you know, you can download this whole folder as a zip file. You can rename it with like an underscore or a year after it or something. It's all, you know, very one-to-one -one with how you would work with just the file system on your computer, which I appreciate. Cloudinary also will create the folder for you. So if you delete the folder, but then you call yes. the URL, it'll just rebuild it. Now, one thing that, of course, we're looking at this, and I would imagine that some people that listen to me and Becky talk or follow things that are happening at Cloudinary, they're probably like, well, where's F auto and Q auto? Why, are, why is there no <laughs> format changes? Why is there no right. quality? Like, but in my opinion, it's not needed here because all Ultimately, the output for this is the social site, the Twitter and Facebook. So they're changing it to whatever that delivery is going to be. It's not like the same purposes as putting onto your website's main blog image or, your, right. or, or something along those lines. Am, am I correct about that? Yeah. One of the options that I, I looked at was Puppeteer will let you pass, I believe it's called device... Uh, pixel ratio. Basically, it lets you manipulate the pixel density of the browser that they're going to spin up. I guess if you want to simulate, you know, some phones are more pixel dense or like a 4K screen. I don't know. But so one thing I looked at was just for quality sake was running it at like uh, 1.5 or two times resolution and then using those cloud and area like Q equals to scale them down. But like you said, it's not really needed because you're giving this over to another server that scrapes it and crunches it in its own way. And then also, I guess this wouldn't really come into the, the Lambda function, but I was able to shave a, a little bit of time off there, like not running it at a higher density. So yeah, it's just not needed to make these any bigger than they have to be. And one thing I'll point out here is that looking at all of this, I mean, this is something that's completely available for you and you're on, I think you're on a free account oh, yeah. of Cloudinaries too. So you're not really paying for this thing that Cloudinary is doing. I mean, obviously it took you time and sweat to be able to put this all together, but in, in, this, in the grand scheme of this, being able to have this done is something that you're able to do essentially for free because of the bandwidth that's being consumed by the plan. Right. Yeah. I am on the free tier and by not doing those transformations, that was one other thing that kind of didn't eat into my credits. And the, the free tier is super generous. I don't have a ton of people uh, on my blog, but this post, I imagine this is sort of how you all found it. This post got shared by a few people. You can kind of see the big spike here where uh, right. CSS Trick shared it, uh, which was super cool. But yeah, it all, you know, I'm at what, like not even halfway for this this month of, of credits used. So yeah, the free tier is super generous and kind of by doing the work in the cloud function and just sort of like passing it over for hosting. It's an awesome service. One thing that I, I do want to talk more about with this is something called a 308 redirect. Yeah. How is this, like, what is it? Why is this going to be something that's important for someone that's trying to take a lot of the concepts that we've taught here and do this for their own purposes? So this was something that was sort of inspired by Chris Biscardi is a, a dev in the React community who has an egghead series on I think he uses Playwright to do this. He was doing something slightly differently where he was just using basically a, a redirect status code instead of uploading this to Cloudinary, he was redirecting to this raw image. So I'm not really sure, you know, because I can't get into his media manager to see how that looks for him. What I wanted to do was not return, I guess because of the status code, we can't actually see it because it, it happened so fast. But I wanted to return basically uh, the Cloudinary uh, URL. Uh, well, not that one. 
to an actual image. I wanted to return the URL to the image and not the URL to the serverless function. And so sort of what happens here is in your Lambda function, you ultimately need to return an object, you know, that has a body and some headers, a status code. You normally want to give it 200. And so what I've done is kind of abstract that into a thing here. So yeah, a 200 status code would just be success, right? Like this function ran, it did what it was supposed to do, great job. The kind of one that people are probably most familiar with is a 404, which means like not found or failed. I guess people probably know 500 too, ones that people don't like. But so, <laughs> so something that I learned about a lot in, in agency world is the 300 level redirects or 300 level status codes, which are redirects. I'm definitely not an expert on this, but my understanding that the two popular ones are uh, 301 is a temporary move and 308 is a permanent move. So I guess 301 indicates to a search engine like this page isn't here right now, but it'll probably be back in the future. But I, I opted for 308 permanent redirect because I don't ever really need anybody. I, I don't need like Google knowing about my Netlify function. I just yeah. want them to, to know where this image lives. So in general, yeah, an SEO doesn't really want a function call. Exactly. They, URL. Right. They want a, 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 a static asset or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of, I think I mentioned this a little bit uh, earlier, but the Twitter bot here really wanted, like you just said, the path to a static asset and not to the response from a function. And so I, I messed around with trying to, to trick it into thinking like that this was a path to an asset, but Twitter bot was a little bit smarter than me. And so ultimately I used this, this redirect here to just forward it to the actual path to the asset. And so the way that that will work is when we hit this, this serverless function with a post that already exists in Cloudinary, it will just forward to this. And this is what we're seeing. Well, I guess I navigated away, but that's what we're seeing when, if you were to navigate to the Netlify function here, it would forward you to this like response on Cloudinary. Yeah. And so it'll do the same thing when it generates as well, because ultimately what we get back out of this function is a canonical link to an asset on Cloudinary. And this 308 status code and this location header will tell it where to navigate to. Definitely seems like a best practice, like where if we're trying to make sure that we're doing this in a way where this is going to work because Twitter ultimately needs it to be at this case, this is probably something where if any developer were to try to take these same steps, setting up the 308 redirect is probably something that they need to do to make sure this is all successful, if I'm understanding correctly. Yeah, in my tests with this, you definitely needed to forward a response to Twitter for them to understand this. If you weren't trying to get Twitter to know about this, like if you just needed to get these into your page, if you were going to further do the, the query transformations, you could just return that URL from your function. But if you want different crawlers to understand this correctly, you will need to somehow either, like I said, trick it into thinking that you've given it uh, a path to an image or use a, a redirect to give it an actual path to an image. So now that you've set all this up correctly and once you've gone through your testing, I know you showed iFramely and I, frankly, I think if I had iFramely in previous lives, I would have been way happier because I knew that I used to have to go to Facebook debugger and go to the Twitter card section and do all of these manual tests. <laughs> but ultimately, it seems to be where as long as you can take that URL, bring it into really any type of debugger, you should be able to see how that comes through and make sure that your OG and your Twitter cards are working functionally. The the developer tools on Twitter and Facebook are both, I trust them slightly more than a third party just because it is, you know, you're using the actual Twitter bot here. So yeah, these two debugging tools were great. I definitely did what you said for the other things. Like I've got a lot of iMessages just going to myself, like Slack to Slack bot, just kind of like checking how things work. It's just the only way like, to be sure, you know, it's it, yeah. Just I definitely test posted this on Twitter and like, does it look good? Okay, delete it because I'm not ready. <laughs> like I definitely tested it that way too. And so here's sort of a, a screenshot of like what it looks like in all these different services after I like went and actually like, you know, clipped these out of what is this like? 
Twitter, Facebook, Slack to myself. I think this is Discord and text message here. I know that you had put in to the different parameters about the widths and the heights of that page mm -hmm. that you're ultimately trying to grab there. Is that something where it's like, did you ultimately see that that was like the sweet spot of what's going to work for all of these networks? Or was it more of a case where that was a trial and error scenario? Like, how did you come up with that width and height that you're using for the, uh, the image generation? So the Twitter tag doesn't actually let you choose pixel values. Oh, right. Values. No, but like the OG one I meant. Sorry about that. Oh, right. So I started with what are the dimensions of, of the Twitter um, oh, got it. one and kind of worked backwards from there. I like that. That's actually way smarter than I would have done it. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and the only reason that I even cared about that is because I had this border around the image and they're like this mm -hmm. is strictly a design concern but i wanted to make sure they were the same so that i wasn't just because it will crop if you pass it an image it's the wrong size it'll crop uh, to center i imagine yeah um, i didn't actually test that but if you like zoom in here i wanted this like consistent border around in the different things so i just took what twitter gave me and, and then kind of like figured out what that size was backwards from there that was smart because, I mean, one thing that I've definitely seen with OG images over the years is that if something's too small, as you're saying, like certain aspects would be cropped out. And since you're including text, as mm -hmm. you know, as someone that's very tied to design, that if you crop in the middle of text, it just looks bad. When I kind of looked at this, I was like, this may have taken some really good like <laughs> processes and, and trials, but it, it looks fantastic because uh... as you see, it looks good across all the networks. It's definitely not perfect. And I just have been avoiding this, you know, but uh, <laughs> if you go and you make this like absurd, like it will blow out the image and then you get a screenshot of like just this. But I've been doing a little bit of just making sure the titles aren't too long. You know, one, one cool thing with this just being CSS is like, you can just go make this smaller or somebody, I think it was on Wes Boss's implementation of this. He's using JavaScript to count the length of the title and scale oh, it down smart. if it's too long. So like, you know, since this is all web technologies, really like your imagination is is the limit here because you can kind of do anything really. I love it. I love it. So Ryan, for, for sake of time, so we don't just keep telling you all the great things that you're doing, but <laughs> sure. we're very impressed. <laughs> Ultimately, if someone wants to learn more about doing this, I mean, of course, watching this video is a great way to start. Reading your blog is a great way to start. But if they wanted to expand on the project, if they want to access it, if they want to fork it, what are the things that you recommend people doing? Sure. So not to plug my own blog post, but I did sort of kind of highlight the steps I took here. And if you go all the way down to the very bottom of that post, I linked out to the three people who I looked at their code and it helped me the most. So definitely like, there are all three deeper dives into different aspects of this. Check them out for sure. If you're interested in the code for this, it's on my GitHub account. I and mean, of course, it seems like you're active. I mean, obviously, with a focus on open graph, you're probably involved in social media in certain ways. So if people want to follow you and see what you're up to after all of this, where should we go? I'm probably most active right now on Twitter. Try and keep it mostly code related. Um, <laughs> Not a hundred percent promise. There's probably some other days. stuff on there. <laughs> I have an Instagram, which is actually what this blog post is about. It was it's more of my like designer art type stuff. I don't know how much of an overlap there is there, but I would say Twitter. I'm in a couple of the big Discord groups. You know, anywhere if you just search my name, uh, you'll, you'll find me if I'm there. I don't have any like cool handles or anything that I use <laughs> that I need to get out there. So. <laughs> As you can see, we were able to talk a lot with Ryan about his overall project and even a full hour of discussion between what he was able to do, how he conceived all of these concepts. We probably could have even gone longer with it because there's just a lot of really good information. Plus, I feel like Ryan's just an interesting guy to talk to. Now, when it comes to what we feel are the key takeaways of this episode and Ryan's projects, the first really ties to Open Graph. This is a case where we think it is amazingly important for developers when they are working on a website, a mobile app, whether it's personal, as we were showing with Ryan's blog, or whether it's something that's more tied to a professional website that they're working on, maybe on behalf of a client, maybe on behalf of the company they work for. They should definitely be considering 
how that content is seen on social network channels like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and all the other ones that are using some form of open graph or Twitter cards to understand how that image is being promoted and overall seen on those social networks. So this is definitely something that we think more and more developers should be focusing on like the way that Ryan did. Becky, do you agree? Oh, totally. And I really want to like kind of compliment Ryan on understanding the web and seeing the value. I mean, he's creating a web page that is using query string to get data into a page that he can then take an image out of. And it's so nice. And I think one of the things about Jamstack that is really valuable is that we are returning to the original intention of HTTP, you know, like how we set up web pages and how they're delivered. I commend him again for, you know, he comes from a design background, but he's embraced software and software engineering, and he's created this automation using some advanced tools in reading his work and and other blogs you know posts that he has there's a lot of thought going into creating web pages that are very compatible with the way that the web likes to work in in so thinking about routing for example and and the fact that you are maintaining web pages that map back to your your coat your file structure and they load fast with, with the Svelte being able to render without a lot of extra JavaScript. You don't have to download a framework, say, for every page. <clears throat> and these are things that I think make this whole process of automating much more easy, much more something to embrace. There are limits with working with Lambdas. He recognizes that. He brings in a library for Chrome that can help with that. And I just think that, I think there's a lot of really good things to learn and it's really encouraging to see this kind of development going on. And it's just fun to, to be able to see this evolution taking place. I agree, I completely agree. And the other thing that we've definitely seen is like we saw this with the episode that we had right before this with Chris Coyer, we saw this now of course with Ryan, but browser automation tools are, I think, something that, once again, more and more people should be focusing on, especially when they're looking at Jamstack projects, when they're working with serverless types of functions. Definitely we're seeing between Puppeteer, Ryan also mentions some work with Playwright, kind of a competitor to Puppeteer in some ways, but it is where I think there's a lot of applicability to projects. And it's interesting to see how Chris and Ryan took it in similar ways, but for highly different outputs or end goals where we had it where Chris on his episode was showing how he was taking screenshots of fonts and showing how that would work. Of course, with Ryan's, he's showing how to use this for something that's kind of almost behind the scenes with Open Graph until it's exposed by something like Twitter or even micro browsers like you see with Slack. So it is a case still though with Puppeteer, Playwright, whatever you decide to use, it's worth investigating. Yeah, and I think the fact that you have him walking through the code here in this video, and then you have the blog that goes along with it, that it could be the stimulus for a really great project and maybe something you would even, you know, embellish. Yeah, and if, I, I would imagine that if you embellish him Ryan's project, he'd probably be completely fine with it. So, oh yeah, excellent. he gives a lot of credit. <laughs> if you read his blog at the end, there's some really great credits to all the work that he reviewed before he put it together. I think the last key takeaway here is just also, this is something that Becky and I have talked a lot about, you know, outside of episodes, just in our day-to-day -day work, but it's always good to be able to look at development projects as something, okay, it's good, I learned from that, and then I'm gonna try something new. Ryan started off his personal blog working in Jekyll, then he started moving over to Gatsby and working in React, and then now with Svelte and Sapper. It's definitely a case where learning something new and kind of forcing yourself to, stop it all, archive it all, and start fresh, like the way that Ryan's done now three times of his personal blog. I think it's exciting. I think it's also where it shows that reiterating, it's kind of like in a way where by blowing all the work away and starting fresh, it allows for you to have a fresh mind. And I like how Ryan approached this project that way. Yeah, and you know, this opened my eyes to Sapper a lot where 
I did some reading and there is a movement, there's a framework called Glimmer that goes along with Ember that allows you to actually compile to a bytecode, kind of like you might do with a JVM, a Java, and then there, you would just deliver a small interpreter. And so we're, we're talking about bringing the size of JavaScript on a web page way, way down. And I know that Svelte is kind of looking at this for the future. I love when we get these kind of breakthroughs in thinking. It makes a big difference. It really does. And I mean, we emphasize this a lot in our training, in our tutorials, that you always want to be focusing on the size of your pages. The page load is so important. So for Ryan to be looking at this in a way like, how do I continue to make it as lightweight as possible with some of the functionality that Svelte and Sapper provided, it showed that those iterations of his blog over time ultimately were leading towards just a better user experience, a better reader experience. And also, Becky, some of the work that's being done with even newer technology is exciting too. Yeah, I think we should all really embrace the fact that designers are moving into development because <laughs> I think we saw with Hannah in the first episode and now Ryan that lots of great ideas, you know? Completely, completely agree. Now, you've watched the full episode. If you've made it to this point, and thank you for doing that. A few things that we have for you. If you do share this episode, whether you're watching this in the Cloudinary Academy, whether you're watching this on YouTube, whether you're just listening to this on the many different podcast networks that we are now on, such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Overcast, it goes on and on. But anyway, if you're watching or listening, share this. If you share this and then send us a link to where you shared it, you simply just have to email that at support at cloudinary.com. Our support team will go and increase your Cloudinary plan by one credit. That will help you with just a little bit more work to be able to help with ensuring that all the work you're doing for delivering your images, uploading your images, delivering your videos, uploading those videos, it'll make sure that you don't hit any plan overages in that way to make sure that you are successful with your projects. It's our way of saying thank you for watching our content. And of course, when it comes to just continuing to learn, make sure you're liking and subscribing to all of the different channels that we have, at least the ones that you are watching and listening on, so when you can always find out when the latest episode of Dev Jams is coming out. From behalf of all of us at Cloudinary, we'll hope to see you for the next episode of Dev Jams. <laughs> <laughs>